Scripture gives a detailed description of the manna that the children of Israel ate in the wilderness, even describing the flavor of the manna. What's the significance of the flavor of the manna and how does it relate to the Word of God? We're going to talk about that today on Karis Daily. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gave the well-known Lord's Prayer, and in the middle of that prayer, He said, Give us this day our daily bread. And He was talking about the daily feeding that we're to partake of the Word of God on a daily basis and be fed by the Word. But there's a picture of the daily bread in the Old Testament while the children of Israel were sojourning through the wilderness. God provided bread from, Han from heaven that we call manna. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, and in verse 3, I want to open up talking about the manna and relating the manna to the Word of God. The first revelation that we can find about the manna is that it was something the children of Israel could not provide for themselves. And so Deuteronomy 8, 3, it says, So He humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you. Now, it almost sounds like it's contradicting itself when it says He allowed you to hunger and fed you. Well, it means He allowed you to hunger from what you could provide for yourself, what you could supply for yourself. Then it goes on to say, He fed you, read carefully what it says, with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. And so he's saying in order to partake of this manna, you couldn't depend on your own knowledge. You couldn't depend on something passed down from your fathers or your own efforts. You had to depend fully on the Lord. What's interesting is that we'll go to Exodus 16 in a minute. When the manna first showed up, the children of Israel saw this white substance on the ground and they were saying, what is it? What? And the word manna, we typically romanticize these words from the Bible, but it simply means what? What is it? Because they didn't know what it was. Now, I find that interesting because when the Lord speaks of the manna, He's the only one who knows what its proper name would be. He knows what it is that He used to feed them. But even when the Lord spoke of the manna, the Lord used the word manna, referring to it by the same word that the Hebrews, the people of Israel used, so that He could inherently, every time He spoke of the manna, just in the word he was using, he was reminding them, you don't know what it is, therefore you can't provide it for yourself. Maybe we'll get to heaven one day, and when the Bible talks about to him who overcomes, he'll give to eat of the hidden manna, and maybe we'll find out what its proper name is. I don't know. Maybe we'll get to heaven and mention, I want to try that hidden manna, and the Lord will say, manna, you still call it that? Let me tell you what it's really called. But the Lord referred to it as manna just so that the children of Israel would be reminded inherently every time he said the word, it means what? What is it? He's reminding them, you don't know what it is. So you can't supply it for yourself. Well, revelation from the word works the same way. It can't come through intellect. It can't come through something passed from your fathers through tradition. In fact, the tradition of men makes the word of God of no effect. It can't come from flesh and blood. Just like when Jesus said to Peter, in Matthew 16, blessed you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, the revelation of who Jesus is. It's revelation that can't come from anyone's intellect, anyone's frame of reference. Flesh and blood can't impart it. It's got to come directly from the Spirit of the Lord. You can't get revelation from the Word just by reading with your intellect. You have to have the Spirit quicken the Word and feed you with that daily bread of revelation. And so it's something that you couldn't supply for yourself without the quickening of a spirit. Let's read on in Deuteronomy 8. So it says, I, I'm going to start from the beginning again. He humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know. By the way, it's humbling when you partake of something you couldn't provide for yourself. It goes on to say that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Now they were to gather, the people of Israel were to gather manna every day except on the Sabbath. Every day they were to gather manna and they weren't supposed to leave manna from one day to the next. You couldn't live off of yesterday's manna. In fact, the manna the next day would rot and breed worms. Now, 
I'm not saying it's a perfect correlation because you can, you can still draw upon revelations that you received in years past. But my point is you can't just coast. You, you can't just live off of yesterday's revelation. You have to have a fresh revelation. I heard someone say one time, you can still coast and move forward, but you can only coast downhill. So it, it, coasting is not good and you, and you have to have a daily uh, feeding. You have to partake daily and have a daily revelation of the Word of God. So I want to continue with this concept of comparing the Word of God to the manna. And I'm going to draw out maybe some revelations about the manna that you've never considered. That the manna had a unique twofold purpose. Okay? The first purpose is the most obvious. And that was to feed the children of Israel and satisfy them where they were. So in Exodus chapter 16, when God first gave the manna, matter of fact, before I turn there, let's go to Psalm 105. I'll go to Exodus 16 in a moment. But first, let's go to Psalm 105. And I'll show you in verse 40 that the Lord wanted the manna to satisfy the people of Israel. It was meant to fill and satisfy them where they were. So Psalm 105 and verse 40, it says, The people asked, and he brought quail and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. So the bread of heaven was meant to fill them, to satisfy them where they were. They were meant to find their satisfaction. Yes, there was quail because they demanded meat. And so God answered. He responded and gave them quail. But what was going to satisfy them and fill them was the bread from heaven, the manna. It was meant to satisfy and fulfill them. So let's go to Exodus 16, where we first see the manna introduced to the people of Israel. And I'm going to draw out this twofold purpose of the manna. Again, the first is to satisfy and fill them where they were on a daily basis. So Exodus 16, verse 12, God says, I've heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with meat bread and you shall know that I'm the Lord your God. Notice he said you'll eat meat because that's what you demanded in your complaint. That's what you asked of me. But it's going to be the bread that's going to fill you. See there might be things you ask of the Lord that might add value, add to your life a little bit, but it's only the word of God that will ever fulfill you or satisfy you right where you are. And so that was the first and most obvious purpose of the manna. But there was another purpose of the manna that's a little more subtle and let me just tell you, when the Lord says he'll humble you, I learned this revelation from my wife. I don't even mind telling you, my wife, Dora, solid revelation that she receives from the word regularly. And we were in the Philippines and we were teaching in a minister's conference in the Philippines. And my wife stood up and began teaching on the manna and just brought forth some jaw dropping revelations that I had just never heard. At least I'd never recalled hearing it. And, and she started teaching things about the manna that just blew my mind. I'm about to show you here in a moment. But let me just tell you that after her message was over in the Philippines, we were in a place called Baguio. And, and I walked to her after the message and I said, I've never heard that revelation in my life. And she said, well, I told you just the other night when we were laying in bed. <laughs> and I said, well, what did I say? She said, wow. I, I, apparently I told her, wow, that's good. The moral of the story is listen to your wife. Don't just pretend, men. But anyway, I learned this revelation from her, and it's just very powerful. And so she began to teach on the, the significance of the flavor of the manna. And this is where we're going to draw out our second purpose for manna. So the flavor of the manna is specified in Exodus chapter 16 and in verse 31. Look at verse 31 of Exodus 16. It says, And the house of Israel called its name manna, literally, what, or what is it? And it was like white coriander seed and the taste of it. We're going to get some insight into the taste or flavor of the manna. It says, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. God had told them all the way back in Exodus chapter 3 verse 8. And on multiple occasions, God had said, I'm taking you to a good land, a land that flows with milk and honey. God specified when he was describing the good land where he was taking them, he said it's a land that flows with milk and honey. And every day on the way to that land of Canaan, on the way to that promised land, God was feeding the children of Israel with bread from heaven that it says it was like wafers made with 
honey. Manna had the taste of honey. Well, why would it be significant that God was feeding the children of Israel and allowing them to taste the flavor of honey every day on the way to the promised land? That means every day, listen carefully, every day on the way to the promised land, the children of Israel were being fed with a foretaste of where God was taking them. Now, just let that be a sailor moment for you for just a moment. Let that settle in in your heart. God was giving them a foretaste, the flavor of honey, the manna that carried a flavor of honey, while God took them to a land that flowed with milk and honey. So every day he was feeding them where they were, satisfying them where they were, but he was also giving them a foretaste of where he wanted to take them. Now, this revelation is very, very profound because again, I'm, I'm drawing out a twofold purpose of the manna and I'm going to relate this twofold purpose to our daily feeding of the word of God. So the manna, it was meant to feed and satisfy and fulfill them where they were, but it was also meant to give them a foretaste of where they were going. Now, only the word of God can work in both directions that way to where it satisfies you exactly where you are, but it also gives you a foretaste of where God wants to take you. Only the word can do that. See, if you just live with a sense of destiny and purpose of where you, you're hoping that God's taking you, where you want to go, oh Lord, here am I, send me, but you're not content where you are, you've got to learn to be content where you are, but if you're just... Uh, thinking about where you're going, but you're not satisfied at all where you are, well, then that dynamic will lead to frustration. You'll live frustrated because you're always trying to think about where you're going, but you aren't satisfied or content where you are. The flip side is if you're satisfied and content where you are, but you have no sense of destiny, no sense of purpose, no sense of where you're going, well, that dynamic would lead to complacency. A sense of destiny without a sense of fulfillment or satisfaction leads to frustration. A sense of fulfillment and satisfaction with no sense of destiny leads to complacency. Only the word of God can work in that dichotomy and work both directions to where it satisfies you and feeds you and fills you right where you are. But all that while it's giving you a taste of where you're going so that you're content where you are you're not discontent. You, you learn contentment. You're satisfied where you are, but you're always aware and conscious that you're not staying here. You, you're going somewhere. You've got a land to possess. You've got promises to see fulfilled in your life. So that's what the word of God does. It feeds you and also gives you that, that taste of honey. Now, the children of Israel, they began to disesteem the manna. They began to despise the manna. They began to belittle when they spoke of the man. As a matter of fact, I want you to join me in Numbers 21 and verse 5, and I want you to see how the children of Israel spoke of the manna. Now, this is right around the time that the, the fiery serpents came out and began to bite the children of Israel. It just got to the point where their complaints were just over the top, but they were disesteeming the manna and they were belittling. Listen to how they spoke of the manna. So this is Numbers chapter 21, and I'm going to just read verse 5. You could read the whole context, and I think the whole context is powerful because this is where we get to the bronze serpent on the pole. But let's just read verse 5 here. Numbers 21, 5 says, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. And here's what they said. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. They've been eating to the full every single day. And they say, there's no food. Then they go on to say, there's no water. Well, what about the water that came from rocks to satisfy their thirst? And so they said, there's no food, there's no water. And then listen to this last part of the verse here. And our soul loathes. What a strong word. Loathes, detests this worthless bread. Bread from heaven, bread that God had supplied supernaturally, even when he could have withheld it, 
They weren't even supposed to be in the wilderness 40 years, and yet he made sure that there was more than enough supply to sustain them 40 years all the way till they crossed into the land of Canaan and partook of the produce of Canaan, and then the manna ceased at that point. But they had manna all of the time they sojourned in the wilderness, even longer than was intended, and God could have withheld it. Every time they complained, he could have said, all right, go get your own food. Instead, he continually, faithfully provides, and the man is there for them on a daily basis, and they despise it and say, and at the end of Numbers 21, 5, our soul loathes or detests this worthless bread. Now, was the manna worthless? Absolutely not. It was a gift from heaven, but they despised it and began to call it worthless bread. And sometimes, even if it's subconsciously, we begin to despise the word of God or disesteem the word of God. Well, listen, I know what the word says, but I, I need something more. I need a goosebump. I need some type of experience. I, I need to feel God's love. I need evidence. I need proof. The word's not enough for me. Well, if the word's not enough for you, then nothing will be. Because if you can be carnally persuaded through your five senses, well, you can just as easily be carnally dissuaded through your five senses because that's the same frequency that the devil broadcasts on. But the word of God speaks to the inner witness that quickens you and, and causes your heart to burn within you. And it's a faith that it produces that can't be taken from you when you've chosen the better part. But we oftentimes despise or disesteem the word because I want an experience of some sort. Man, you could read where Peter writes in his epistle that we have a more sure word of prophecy. And he was making reference to the transfiguration when he stood on the mount. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We stood there. We saw. We didn't follow cunningly devised fables from men. We were eyewitnesses. We saw the open heaven. We saw him transfigured on that mount. That's what he was referring to, the transfiguration in his epistle. And then he goes on to say, but we have the prophetic word confirmed. Some translations render it to say, we have a more sure word of prophecy. And you say, well, what could be more sure than seeing an open heaven and hearing the voice of the father boom from heaven. And Peter says, what's more sure than that is the certainty we get from the scriptures. He said, knowing that, knowing that no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. So the scripture is given to us, but we don't need to disesteem. Just like the children of Israel, they said, our soul loathes this worthless bread. Have you ever treated the word of God as if it were worthless bread, as if it were a common thing? Man, I want to challenge you. Take the word of God, partake of it on a daily basis as was intended. Let it feed you where you are so that you don't grow frustrated or weary or discouraged, but let it give you a foretaste of where you're going so you don't grow complacent. So don't disesteem the word. Now, I want to continue as we wrap this up. I want to continue in this idea of eating the word and partaking of the word and, and, and that flavor of honey that it has. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2. And we're going to look at the end of Ezekiel chapter 2 into Ezekiel chapter 3. And we're going to see where the Lord gave Ezekiel a literal scroll and told Ezekiel to eat the scroll. Okay. So it's kind of a bizarre picture. Ezekiel receives this scroll from the Lord symbolizing his word and he's supposed to eat the scroll. So let's read what happened here with the prophet Ezekiel. We'll start in Ezekiel chapter two. Again, this is the end of Ezekiel two and we'll just go right into chapter three. So in Ezekiel chapter 2, starting in verse 9, Ezekiel says, Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Verse 10, And then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. So Ezekiel's given a scroll, and I want you to remember, keep in mind, because I'm going to make reference back to this detail in a moment, but written on the scroll, both on the inside and the outside, were lamentations, mourning, and woe. But notice what happens. This is the end of chapter 2. Now we go into the first verse of chapter 3, and in chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord speaking to Ezekiel, he says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll. 
and go and speak to the house of Israel. Now, I'm just going to put a little side note here to the, to the ministers. Let me just talk to, and I believe all believers are ministers, but if you're regularly ministering the word, teaching the word, I want to make a little parenthetical reference here to, to talk to the people who minister the word on a regular basis. Notice in verse 1, God tells Ezekiel, eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. God instructs Ezekiel to eat the scroll before going to speak the word. Now, this is a profound revelation. You're not ready to go speak the word until you've eaten the scroll. You've got to eat and partake first. I don't want to get too far off track here, but again, I'm still just addressing people who teach the word on a regular basis. But the word of God, the Bible says in Isaiah 55 that it, it gives seed to the sower, bread to the eater, that same Images reused, Paul uses it in Corinthians referring to finances. But in Isaiah 55, we, we see that the word gives seed for the sower, bread for the eater. The word is both seed and bread. And I've known a lot of ministers. As a matter of fact, I have been this type of minister in the past where you become good at extracting the seed to impart, but you neglect to eat the bread for yourself. And you've got a responsibility to get into the word, feed on it, eat on it for yourself before you try to go and sow the seed into others. I remember, man, I, I don't have time to tell all the stories, but I remember ministering to a guy who was considerably older than I am. And it, actually at the time I was in my early 20s and he was probably in his 60s and he was having regular panic attacks. Well, I ministered to him, ministered the truth of the word with conviction, with passion. I saw this man set free from panic attacks Again, I was in my early 20s. Well, a couple days after I ministered to him, I myself had a panic attack. And I asked the Lord, what's the deal? How can I teach and, and impart the word as a teacher with such conviction? And yet I'm suffering from the very things in my own life. I'm teaching at a higher level than what I'm living. How can I see the disparity begin to lessen? And the Lord told me, it's because you're going to the word for seed, but you're neglecting to go for the bread. You've got to eat it before you impart it. It's like on the airplane. You've got to put on your own oxygen mask before offering assistance to others. Well, this is the same principle. And so in Ezekiel chapter three, verse one, he says, son of man, eat what you find, eat the scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. Don't try to go speak until you've eaten. Eat the scroll first and then go speak the word. So anyway, that was supposed to be my side note. Now let me continue. I hope that encouraged whoever's teachers of the word that are listening to me right now. And so Ezekiel did what God said. Ezekiel eats the scroll. Now, remember, the scroll has written on it. We saw at the end of chapter two, lamentation, mourning, woe, okay? A lot of type of stuff that you find in the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, there's a lot of judgment proclaimed and lamentation, mourning, woe. Well, that's what this scroll contained, but it was still the word of God. And so let's read on in verse two, Ezekiel says, this is Ezekiel three, verse two. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, son of man, Feed your belly and fill. And so the first thing God told Ezekiel to do is eat this scroll and fill. Eat to the filling. Don't just get a little sampling of it. Don't just get a little taste of it. Eat till you're full. Fill your belly. Okay. So verse three, he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill. Wherever you are watching this, I want you to say that out loud. Fill. Okay. Eat till you're satisfied. Fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate. Now we move on from filling yourself with the word. Now Ezekiel begins to take note of the flavor. Remember I said earlier, the, the manna had that twofold purpose. First, to fill you where you are, but also notice the flavor of where he's taking you, the flavor. And so Ezekiel takes note of the flavor of the scroll. So let's read verse three again. He says, son of man, feed your belly, fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. So I ate. He said, it was in my mouth like what? Like honey, like what? Say it wherever you are, say honey, like honey in sweetness, just like the manna. The word carried this flavor of honey. Now, here's something that you don't need to miss. The scroll tasted like honey, but what were the written contents of the scroll? Well, remember from the end of chapter two in verse 10, he specified the written contents of that scroll. And it says that the scroll contained on the inside and on the outside lamentation and mourning and woe. Well, if you're partaking of lamentation, mourning and woe, you wouldn't think that it would have a, a sweet flavor, would you? 
because it, it contains things that we would think aren't pleasant to partake of, aren't pleasant to read. Well, the Old Testament has a, a lot of lamentation, mourning, and woe, but we see resolve and redemption through the Messiah and through the new covenant. But even if you're reading the scroll containing lamentation, mourning, and woe, it still has the same sweet flavor of honey. Why? Because it's still his word and it always has the sweetness of his word. You'll always taste and see that he's good. He'll never stop being good. Even if it's a hard word, even if it's a hard word to read, it still is the sweetness of honey because you always taste. He never stops being good. His goodness is never diminished. Even if it's a hard word, he's good. You taste, you see he's good. You taste the word, it's still as sweet like honey. So Ezekiel partakes of a scroll that he tastes and it tastes like honey, but it's written, it's got lamentation, mourning, and woe. See, I want to encourage you, get into the entirety of scripture, even the parts of the Old Testament, because there is resolve, there is redemption through the Messiah. But even if the scroll you're reading and eating has the, the, the content of lamentation, mourning, and woe, if it's letter and not spirit, well, excuse me, if it's the opposite, if it's spirit, but not just letter, it's going to produce in you that it's going to fill you, but it's going to give you the sweetness of honey because the word always has that flavor. You can recognize the flavor of the word. It's written in Psalm 119, and we'll start wrapping up with this passage. But if you go to Psalm 119 in verse 103, we see the flavor of the word, just like the flavor of manna, just like the flavor of the scroll that Ezekiel ate. Even though the scroll, the contents were lamentation, mourning, and woe. It was a hard word, but if it's the word of the Lord, even if it's a hard word, it's going to have the sweetness of honey because it's you taste and see he's good. It's, a, it's good, even if it's a hard word. So Psalm 119, verse 103, it says here, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Go eat the scroll. Eat the scroll, even the parts of the scroll that are written with lamentation and mourning and woe, because even there you can see what points to the Messiah, what points to the Savior, what points to redemption, what Jesus fulfilled, what Jesus accomplished, how he redeemed all things and restored. So eat the scroll from front to back, inside and out, all of it, even the parts that are difficult to read. And if you'll read, not letter, but spirit, get into the word, feed on it, let it feed you and fill you and satisfy satisfy you right where you are, but also let it give you that sweetness of honey and remind you of the sweetness of the land that he has set before you to possess, the sweetness of the promise that awaits you. Why? Because God wants you to be in a glorious place right now, right where you are, but he wants to take you from glory to glory. And you're going to learn that as you dive into the word and as you eat the scroll. So I pray that this message today has encouraged you, has stirred your heart, has edified you. We're here every day on, on Karis Daily, seven days a week. And it's different instructors who are all receiving things from the Lord to impart to you. Join us daily. We're right here. We want to share the word with you. You can go online, watch things on demand, karisdailygtn.com. Right now, if you reach out, we have a, a free offer of Andrew Womack's book, Effortless Change. I've read that book years ago and still bearing fruit in my life. Reach out and get that offer of our free book. That's the current at the time of the recording. Uh, but you can watch this on demand, see what the current offer is online. If you're in need of prayer, reach out to us. The number's at the bottom of your screen, 719-635-1111. I love you. You are blessed, favored, and loved. And I'll see you next time right here on Karis Daily. Oh,